Hey, did I tell you your eyesight? I want to thank everybody for coming out on a nice summer evening like this. The idea for this event came to me when turning on the TV and every time I turn around, Roy Spencer is either John Stossel or 2020. Or been arrested. <laughs> uh, I want to extend a thank you to Sue and Ken and the folks at Bayless for putting on this event, hosting it. I want to thank Roy for traveling up here. Um, it's hard to believe, but 40 years ago, Tom, Roy, and uh, Ernie, 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 a whole bunch of them graduated from Sue High. And uh, I remember my kids asking me, well, you know, I always say, I know that guy, you know, I tell them, and they say, well, what's Roy like? Is he, I said, well, He's not your typical scientist. He's not <laughs> Sheldon Cooper. He's a guy played in a rock band. He had these great Elvis sideburns. <laughs> and the lead guitar. And then Tom Savoy was the bass. And, and uh, the name of the band was called Native Son. And I can't think of a almost prophetic name. He turned out Native Son, he came home. And we really appreciate your coming. I think that's the prodigal son, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're really proud of you and appreciate you coming and sharing your your, your writings and discussion with us. So welcome Roy Spencer. Isn't he sweet? <laughs> Sparkly. <laughs> um, every time I give a talk, I usually snow people with the, uh, the details and I'm always trying to make my talk simpler, you know, because I like to talk about my research. So what I've tried to do this time is I'm going to talk almost nothing about my research. So hopefully I won't snow you under. Um, anyway, uh, let's see, a little bit of history. I came to the Sioux in 1969. I think it was January of 69. Showed up at Rita Spencer's doorstep. Uh, she was nice enough to, to take me in because I was about to be orphaned. Uh, my mother had died of cancer. I lived in Bettendorf, Iowa. My dad was going back and forth to Vietnam, and he was having to leave for Vietnam. So I had a choice of either going to my live with my aunt and uncle in, in northern Michigan or go to military school. So, <laughs> mm, I'll take a chance on the relatives. Uh, so I lived, lived with them for, for two or three years. I forget what it was. And then my dad retired, and then he moved up here, and he hated the cold. Oh my gosh, he hated the cold. Um, anyway, I thought I wanted to go into computers. That, that turned out not so good. Tom. Tom Savoy and I went to Michigan State, and your cousin Bill and Kent McPherson, we were all there at the same time, rooming together, well, two different rooms. And uh, and after one year, actually after like two months of computers, I decided that's not what I was gonna go into, and I had to decide, what am I gonna go into? And the thing that I learned to love about the suit was the weather. So I thought, well, can I work in weather? That would be cool. So I went to the weather service office. I went, you know, can I get a job here? <laughs> well, you might want to go to school first. <laughs> oh, crap. Well, okay. So, uh, and I married Rini, uh, Doreen Moon. We now have two children. Uh, I, we, after two, we figured out what caused it and put an end to that. <laughs> We have two girls, Jillian and, and Christine. Uh, one's just about 30, one's uh, just about 27. And uh, have went from school to school till I finally got my PhD at uh, Wisconsin. And then I took a job with NASA in Alabama. We've been in Huntsville, Alabama ever since. Uh, started working, uh, they wanted to build up a, uh, a weather or a climate research satellite. I was working at satellites, you know, a lot of stuff we do in weather and climate is with satellites. Uh, so I wanted to, um, wanted to stay in satellites and they wanted to build up a satellite program there. Well, it's NASA, you know, satellites, right? Um, and uh, at first I started working on an experiment to fly on the space shuttle and they asked me if I wanted to go, I said, no thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then the Challenger disaster happened, and that sank a lot of missions uh, and a lot of experiments. Uh, and then where things turned towards the climate was um, about 20 years ago, John Christie and I came up with a method for precisely monitoring Earth temperatures from satellites. 
and that's what we've been doing ever since part of our time. And I'm also involved in other climate research related to how sensitive the climate system is, and I won't get into that, basically. You know, if you poke the climate system, how much does it respond? That's the kind of thing we're trying to understand because we're sort of poking at adding CO2 to the atmosphere. Uh, so that's sort of a quick history of, of me. Um, the last 20 years have been really interesting since I got into the climate stuff because, you know, you get to know media people. I've got to know uh, a number of interesting people. Um, John Stossel, Glenn Beck, Rush Limbaugh. Um, it's weird because it seems like I was in high school watching John Stossel and uh, what's her name? Barbara Walters <laughs> on TV. You know? And it's now, now I know him. And then like the, the last show I did with him some months ago, I, he, he sent me an email afterwards. And he forwarded an, an email from his son to me. And he said, looky here, Roy. My son thinks I'm cool because I know you. That's amazing. Um, okay, so we do a lot with satellites. This is one of NASA's Earth observing satellites, the Aqua satellite. I'm the lead scientist on this instrument that's actually built in Japan, so we work a lot with the Japanese, and I've been to Japan more times than I wish I would have gone. Um, and it measures all kinds of things. You know, you've heard about the disappearing Arctic sea ice and all of that. It measures that. It measures ocean water temperatures. I stumbled across this. There's a lot of products out there that I don't even know of that people are using this instrument for, even though I'm the lead scientist on it. <laughs> and I ran across this. Oh, look, it's, it's lake surface temperatures in Lake Superior. This is from last week. Um, it's like in the 50s or maybe 60 out here, supposedly. Of course, out here, it's like in the upper 30s. <laughs> so summer hasn't hit the center, center part of Lake Superior. Of course, it could be it never reaches the center part of Lake Superior. <laughs> uh, let's see. Some of the big picture things I want to mention about global warming. Um, and you know, Tom Ewing was trying to give me an idea, because I really don't understand how the public views global warming. I mean, I'm too close to it. So what is it you know, that the public thinks of when they hear global warming? So he was trying to explain that to me this morning. Um, basically, 25 years ago when I started in this business, all climate change was natural. And now things have completely changed to where virtually all the scientists working in this field have decided there's no such thing as natural climate change. It's all man-made. You know? And I'm like, where does this come from? Maybe I'm too old. I don't know. <laughs> Am I too old, Bob? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I want to point out that global warming or cooling can be natural or man-made, and that there is abundant evidence of uh, previous natural climate change around the world on all different kinds of time scales. Climate, we're usually talking decades to centuries, but it can be even longer than that. We really don't understand what causes it. Um, now, so it has warmed. We have had, you know, quote unquote, global warming in the last 30 to 50 years. Um, and I think some of that probably is man made. Um, the CO2 we put in the atmosphere should be having some warming effect. We understand the theory pretty well of how CO2 traps infrared radiation, which helps keep the Earth from cooling to outer space. And hopefully that'll be as technical as I get in the talk. Um, and so it should cause some warming, but I think it's totally up in the air how much of the warming we've seen is due to that versus natural processes. Uh, because we do have evidence that, that things have been almost this warm in the past and possibly even warmer a thousand years ago during the medieval warm period. Um, now what's amazing is that, you know, everyone that's wringing their hands over increasing carbon dioxide, the whole CO2 causing global warming thing, it's basically theory. You can't prove that it happens, okay? The theory's pretty sound, but it's still theory. Now what do we know for sure about CO2? We know it's necessary for life on Earth. <laughs> the start of the food chain on land and in the ocean requires CO2, and I've had plant physiologists tell me that for how necessary it is for life on, the, on Earth, it's amazing how little CO2 there is in the atmosphere. 
In fact, I've, I've had it explained to me, it's almost like life on Earth is sucking on CO2 as hard as it can, and it can't suck any harder. And they say that's probably why for all of the CO2 that we pump into the atmosphere every year from burning fossil fuels, it, it's like it doesn't matter how much we pump in, whether it's, you know, now it's huge amounts, uh, you know, 50 years ago it wasn't nearly as much. Nature, every year, takes out about 50%. Sucks it up, you know. And we're seeing evidence now that, you know, there is more photosynthesis around the Earth uh, as a result of the increase in CO2. So I'm just trying to point out, I'm not saying that it's, it's all good, I'm just saying a lot of what you hear through the media, you're only hearing half the story. You're not hearing the benefits of increased CO2. Unfortunately, there seems to be this almost religious view amongst Earth scientists that, you know, nature is really fragile and anything we do is inherently wrong. And to me, that's not scientific. You know, it could be some of the stuff we do is actually good for nature. And since we know CO2 is necessary for life on Earth, and there's so little of it in the atmosphere, and you know, they've, they've figured out that probably 15% of our increase in, in proc, uh, crop productivity in the last 50 years is, is just enrichment of the atmosphere with CO2. But anyway, it's just something to keep in the back of your mind when you hear all of these debates. Uh, now, of course, there's also this issue of increased <coughs> CO2 increases the CO2 content of the ocean. They call that ocean acidification, which is a misnomer because the pH of the ocean is solidly alkaline, and they think it is de decreased on average from about 8.1 to 8. But we really don't know because there's huge natural variations in ocean pH depending on where you are in the oceans and the seasons and uh, all of that. So there's, it's kind of like trying to figure out an average temperature of the Earth. It's, it's kind of hard because the temperatures vary all over the place, you know. Uh, same thing with pH in the ocean, only it's even harder because uh, pH stations in the ocean are probably not as abundant as temperature <laughs> measurements around the Earth <laughs> on land. Um, so this is also more of a, a theoretical estimate that the pH of the ocean has decreased from 8.1 <coughs> to 8. And it turns out that a lot of the early science has been done about uh, this change in pH of the ocean from increasing CO2 is damaging organisms. Well, it looks like maybe that was a stretch of the truth. And in fact, there, there's more and more evidence now that uh, more CO2 in the ocean is actually helping the food chain there because it starts with photosynthesis too in the ocean with phytoplankton. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of uncertainty in this. Unfortunately, none of the uncertainty ever makes it through uh, the media, you know, because in the news, you only hear the, you know, oh my God, we're all going to die kind of news. You, you know, you never hear the news, hey, maybe everything's going to be okay. <laughs> Fox. Uh, yeah, Fox, Fox is a little different. Okay, uh, this shows some temperature proxies over the last 2,000 years. Uh, it's an average of a whole bunch of temperature proxies taken from mostly the northern hemisphere. And basically, what it, I, the reason why I like to show this is that every vertical line is a century, okay? We're out here, well, we're past here now. Uh, the red is our observational record, the temperature record where we actually have thermometers, and I smoothed it kind of the way all this data is inherently smooth. But if, if this is anything close to true, um, it suggests that just about every century you've got global warming or cooling. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people have led us to believe, you know, if you just listen to the media, that temperatures have always remained constant until humans came along, and it's just not true. At least that, well, we don't, I hate to use true because science isn't about truth. Um, you know, there's evidence, and you believe the evidence, and even if we have perfect measurements, we're not always sure, in fact, we're usually not sure what they mean in terms of cause and effect. Um, okay, now. Nevertheless, 2012 does appear to have been a record warm year in the U.S. anyway. The U.S. is a little over 2% of the Earth's surface. Now in Australia in 2012, the temperatures were below normal, and Australia is about the same size as the U.S. Uh, but yeah, we, it, last year was a warm year, um, averaged over the whole year. Uh, but global temperatures have remained flat now for about 15 years, and this has been a mystery. Uh, now, some of us aren't terribly surprised because 15 years ago we were saying that the global warming predictions that we're suggesting 
you know, a lot of warming uh, could be wrong. And, uh, and they were, and I'll show evidence of that. Uh, climate models, we use computerized climate models to, to predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, they've, they haven't been total failures, and I'm a, I'm a supporter of using the computerized climate models. It's basically taking what you think you know about the physics and putting it into a computer. You know, sticking numbers and equations, because uh, otherwise you're just hand-waving. So I'm, I'm supportive of computer models, but it's the people that run the models uh, basically control what come out of them. It's the whole garbage in and garbage out issue. Uh, and I think they're being misused to some extent. Uh, there is a quick concern that maybe the excess heat that's building up at the surface is being now transported, mixed down into the ocean deeper than they thought it would be. Uh, it just is we're not sure because um, the amount of heat is relatively small. The ocean is very deep. So, you know, they've measured a warming of the deep oceans of hundredths of a degree, they think, in the last, say, 30 years. Well, you know, are our measurements, temperature measurements in the deep ocean globally averaged good to hundredths of a degree? I don't know. But it matters because that's a lot of heat. A few hundredths of a degree difference for the deep, deep oceans represents a lot of joules of energy. Okay. Um, and then this is something that's that's going to raise its ugly head again. And I, and this, you know, Tom, when Tom Ewing this morning was telling me about this stuff, about how, you know, most people just can't grasp the whole global warming issue because it's all out in the future, right? I mean, you know, maybe my kids will have to worry about it, but i got to worry about putting food on the table tomorrow. Or I have to worry about what I'm doing next week or something, you know. So why should I worry about it? global warming over such a long period of time. And I think that's maybe why a lot of the politicians and scientists that are looking for funding are now talking about severe weather. You know, oh, you know, every big tornado or Hurricane Sandy that occurs, you know, well, this is global warming happening today. So, you know, every severe weather event now that happens, of course, is due to global warming. Well, it just is that by all objective measures, none of our severe weather measures have changed over time. I mean, they do change a lot from decade to decade, but there's been no long-term trend in any of them. Uh, okay, here's our temperature. This is what John, Christy, and I have been doing for the last 20 years, is piecing together different satellites and uh, intercalibrating them and adjusting for sensor differences and stuff like that. Uh, this is global average atmospheric temperatures uh, over the last 34 years. 79 is when the satellite record started, so this is sort of our original claim to fame right here. And it does show warming. Um, not as much warming as, as would have been expected, though, uh, by the climate modelers. Uh, let's see. Okay, now this, this is sort of a spaghetti graph. Um, all of those squiggly lines, each one of those is a climate model. And those squiggly lines represent hundreds of millions of dollars that have been invested around the world in the climate modeling ever enterprise. And this is their latest estimates of how global temperatures should have changed since 1975. Okay, so all of these different models you know, are predicting this kind of future for global average surface temperature. Uh, the solid line is just an average of all of them. This UAH, that's our satellite temperatures. And this is our competitor out in California. Frank Wentz uh, owns remote sensing systems. He's a friend of mine, but we're still competitors. Um, and as you can see, so the point here is the measurements are trending below what the climate models say. And what's amazing is that the climate modelers have known that this discrepancy has been shaping up in the last five to 10 years. And they still won't adjust their models downward because they can, but they won't. This is just, this is, these are atmospheric temperatures just in the tropics. And there the discrepancy is even bigger. So here's, this is like 73 models, I think. More and more models keep showing up. This, uh, the data from these models is being gathered at um, data distribution centers. And so more model runs keep showing up over time. But anyway, here's the observations. Um, circles, these are actually radiuson balloons, okay? The green circles, there aren't that many radiusons in the tropics, but this is the average of them. And then the, the blue 
squares are the average of our two satellite data sets. Uh, they're measuring the same layer. We made it so that the radius ons are, are average, so they measure the same layer that the satellite does. does. And you can see there's reasonably good agreement between them. But there's a huge discrepancy with the, with the, with the models. Uh, this is going to be really hard for the modelers to avoid, but they're experts at glossing over any problems with the models. Okay, what about in the US? Um, I do some consulting for some people that um, monitor corn crop health and all of that. They, what they do is they predict what the corn yield is going to be each year as far in advance as possible so investors can trade money and do whatever they do buying and selling corn. So I already had some graphs available to show what happens in the U.S. Corn Belt. We grow the most corn in the world, uh, sort of the corn bread basket of the world. <coughs> corn bread basket. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's good. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to ask myself if I can use that again. Um, that's corny. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, this is uh, precipitation, June, July, August, which is the main growing season for crops in the U.S. Uh, 2012 was a big drought year. Some of us remember 88 uh, is a big drought year. 76 was a little more before my time. Uh, um, <laughs> anybody remember the 30s droughts? Right that's, here. Uh, that's, a little before that's, my time. That's, that's before your time. That's the dust bowl right there. Yeah, that's dust bowl here. But you know, you see, there's a lot of there's year-to-year -year variability that's huge, uh, and I think the only reason that this line, you know, regression or a, a trend line fit to the data tilts upward is because of the 1930s were in the record, the, the dust bowl days. Okay. Uh, Temperatures. These are uh, summer temperatures in the Corn Belt, and you know, 2012 was a record warm year through, you know, average throughout the year. But look at the 1934 and 1936, and those weren't due to driving SUVs. I guarantee you. <laughs> um, I threw this graph in because. You know, back in the 1960s, Paul Ehrlich wrote this book, Population Bomb, and he predicted that well before 2013, you know, half of humanity was going to die of starvation, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> and, you know, this shows since 1960 crop yield, so how much is being produced per acre. Okay, this, in other words, this, this, these increases in crop uh, productivity isn't because we're planting more land, this is how much per acre is being produced. We're getting better and better at growing more food on the same amount of land. So this is uh, corn, soybeans, and wheat, I believe. And some of that increase is probably due to CO2 fertilization, but it's mainly due to changes in farming practices and um, you know better crop varieties, things like that. Uh, corn, I think they plant it a lot denser now. They plant, you know, more more corn plants per square yard than they used to, a lot more. Uh, you know, this whole severe weather is getting worse. It's for, for strong to severe tornadoes in the U.S., it's definitely not true. We have statistics that go back to 1950, and uh, it's definitely not the case that we've had more tornadoes in the U.S. If you, if you count the weak tornadoes and look at those statistics, there has been an increase, but you know, we've got more roads, we've got people spread out everywhere now. We've got video cameras and, you know, tornadoes can't happen without somebody seeing them, you know. They can't get any privacy. <laughs> <laughs> like they used to. The guy I know does um, this statistic, which is tropical cyclone activity. Uh, this is global. The top curve is global. The, the, the bottom curve is northern hemisphere. This is the total wind energy in three dimensions uh, summed up for all the tropical cyclones. Uh, it's not just events, it's the total tropical cyclone wind energy. Um, and there's a lot of you know, decade to decade variability. Uh, 2005 was the year that we got hit really bad. Uh, I mean, there were a lot of tropical cyclones and an unusually large proportion of them hit the United States. <coughs> 
So, you know, in 2005, everyone was thinking, oh no, the end is near. You know, my sister lives in, uh, down in the Florida Keys. And she was like, we can't live here any longer. You know, this is just terrible. Is this the way it's gonna be from now on? Well, I don't know, it's, you know, I think it's just weather, you know, could change. Well, you know, and then look what happened. There hasn't been a category three or stronger hurricane hit the U.S. since that year, since 2005. We haven't had a major hurricane hit yet. Now, people in New York City might say, Sandy, I think, should, you know, qualify, but and Sandy wasn't quite there in terms of intensity. You know, it just happened to hit where a lot of people live during high tide, you know. Sandy-class storms occur probably just about every year somewhere in the northern hemisphere. It's just rare for them to hit land, and especially where millions of people live. But it happens. It, it happened back in the 1950s, two or three times. I'm not an expert on the exact years and storms, but I know Joe Bastardi. Some of you might recognize that name. He's an absolute nut about weather history. I guess because his dad is a meteorologist, too. Yeah, I thought I was obsessive about weather. That guy's crazy. <laughs> um, wildfires. You, know, you hear about how bad the wildfires are getting. Well, yes and no. Um, the Forest Service years ago changed their practices. For a long time, they would try to go out and put out every forest fire that occurred. And then they finally realized, you know, stopping all of these fires from burning you were getting a lot of fuel building up in the woods that used to burn off naturally when there were you know dry lightning strikes and whatever that you know a hundred years ago they just let these things burn there wasn't much you could do so they changed to a let it burn uh, strategy a few decades ago and as a result we've had more acres burned as all that excess fuel is getting burned up and there, but fewer fires. So we're getting fewer fires, but they're major fires as all of that pent up fuel is, is being burned. And if you heard recently that the Colorado wildfire was something like the worst on record, blah, 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 it was nowhere near the worst on record. It might have been for damage, it happened to hit a bunch of homes, you know, but it wasn't that big of a wildfire. Okay, what can we do about it anyway? Even if you know, we had severe global warming, and it was changing our weather uh, substantially, noticeably, demonstrably. What can we do about it anyway? Um, well, of course, the United States is only part of the problem, and they've done calculations that even if all these climate models are correct, and we substantially reduce our use of fossil fuels and somehow switch to renewables, um, it will have an almost unmeasurable effect on global temperatures in the future, partly because now we're a relatively small proportion of the globe emitting CO2, uh, but also because it takes a long time for the results to be seen, and we can't measure perfectly accurately. You know, we're, we're trying to measure hundredths of a degree of warming when the year-to-year -year changes are half a degree globally averaged. You know, we're trying to find the needle in a haystack. Uh, so in other words, um, you know, nature still rules in terms of, of climate variability, weather variability, and we're lost in the noise somewhere, probably causing some warming, uh, but I don't think we know how much. Um, but nevertheless, we will eventually run out of fossil fuels. Um, well, actually, we'll never run out of fossil fuels because Economically, at some point, anything that you're trying to go get gets so hard to find, you quit looking. <laughs> okay, so the, some fuels will remain in nature because we'll just stop going and getting them because they're too hard to reach. Um, and we'll have other alternatives anyway. So how we transition to new energy technologies is a matter of economics and engineering. It's really not a scientist's job, although I do play an economist I've got a book here that's actually used in a college economics course. Um, 
I learned quite a bit about, I, I'm fascinated by basic economics. Actually, I'm fascinated by the public not understanding basic economics, which then leads to their views related to what the government should or shouldn't do, or um, you know their politics, who they vote for, and all of that. Uh, there's our understanding of basic economics is just abysmal, and I wish that it was taught in high schools, um, but it, it's not. Um, anyway, uh, and I've got to work with some uh, economists, um, and. Maybe they're too polite, but they haven't told me that I'm wrong yet on any of it. <laughs> and it may well be they're just being polite. I don't know. Everyone tells me I'm wrong about my science. I mean, uh, okay. So, summary. I think natural variability will continue to dominate our weather. Um, the science of global warming is uncertain. And remember, I mentioned that we're in sort of a holding pattern. Um, Global average surface temperatures haven't warmed in about 15 years now. And I think they'll continue on up, but if we really don't understand global warming theory, uh, you know, that I, I mentioned early on, I think adding CO2 to the atmosphere should add, should cause some warming. I don't think we know how much. Uh, if, if temperatures start going down, you know, the, the whole game is over as far as global warming goes. But I don't think they will. Some people are betting on, on you know, a coming new mini ice age. And, and if that happened, you know, all the global warming scientists are out of a job. Well, they'll just switch to global cooling scientists. <laughs> um, wherever the money is. Uh, as I mentioned, more CO2. The only thing we know for sure about CO2 is it's ne necessary for life on Earth. Um, the rest of the stuff is, is all in the realm of theory. Um, I, I think it's pretty strong theory that's, that adding CO2 should cause some warming, but I, I don't think we understand how much. Uh, there's no evidence of more severe weather. Uh, I've already said I think human-caused global warming likely exists to some extent, and, but we just don't, we don't know how much. Uh, if you ever hear that there are fingerprints of human cause versus natural warming, it's not true. There are no. Whatever causes warming, the, the warming appears the same way. There is no fingerprint of of human caused global warming. And I can go into that if you ever have a question. Just I brought a bunch of, um, remind me to, to put out my cards in case people have questions, because people always have questions that they didn't think about. Um, what to do about it anyway. Um, the thing I didn't say, and I should have, because I usually shoot from the hip when I give a talk. I don't have a laundry list of, of things that I wanted to say. Um, I'm looking at John Stewart because he works in the energy industry. Um, renewable energy is very expensive, and it's hard to produce very much of it because the energy density is so low. Whether it's wind or solar, it's just not very concentrated the way fossil fuels are. Um, I guess our Apparently, our, our, our most abundant and cost-efficient renewable energy maybe is hydro. Would, would you say that's true, John? What do you think, Don? Don would be a better expert than that. Coal? Uh, no, in renewable energy. Oh, renewable. Yeah. Hydro is very limited, right? I mean, I think that all the hydro that's been developed in the United States has been developed. Well, I know, I know, but it's uh, it's still renewable and it's still yes. available for the time being. Um, okay, and then this is one idea that I think is kind of cool, and maybe it's because I'm a meteorologist and I like weather kind of stuff. This is a, a technology for harnessing daily heating in the uh, in the desert and funneling all of that warm air through turbines. Tallest, but they 
scale down to 20%. I don't know whether they're gonna do the observation that the top, but I think that would be really cool. That's, that's way up there. We live, Rainy and I live next door to a tower, a TV tower, that is 1,500 feet tall. And it's, it's pretty cool. There's a lot of neat weather stuff that happens in that tower. So anyway, this thing generates hot air that comes in at about 30 knots. It's turning into pretty disturbing. Up to 200 megawatt output. And supposedly, if they go according to plan, it requires very little maintenance in the last few decades. This was the original plan. It was a uh, one kilometer, 2,000 meter power. Now they're down to eight. There will be no plants under it. But that's just the deal. because the investors want to have an independent review of the, of the design of the plan. And I can provide some input on it anyway. Hmm. Uh, so that's the end of my talk. I wanted to allow enough time for uh, questions, and then we're going to get rid of some books that I bought from Amazon. Because <laughs> I long ago ran out of my books, so anytime I want my books, I have to go to Amazon to buy them. So we bought some and we carted them up here in case people want to get them. They're all 10 bucks each, which is basically what I paid on average for them. I mean, I, we could charge different for the different ones depending on what they cost on Amazon, but it's too hard to deal with that. So, you know, 10 bucks each, and, and that includes my signature. Thank <laughs> you.